Sue McKenna, Director of the Centre for Postgraduate Studies at Rhodes University. I think for many people, when they embark on a PhD journey, they are embarking on what becomes a very long and very lonely endeavour. Others are lucky enough to have a community and to find the support that they need along the way. What you're about to watch is a series of short videos all by people who have earned the title Doctor and all of whom have used legitimation code theory in their research. So kia ora everybody, my name's uh, Dr Bobby Hunt and I am zooming in from Auckland, New Zealand and I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction of who I am. So I am a senior lecturer at Unitech Institute of Technology which is a polytechnic uh, of many different fields, um, but my background really is in teaching art and design. And one of the reasons that motivated me to go do my doctoral studies was motivated by my interest as a street artist and also graffiti artist, and to explore some of the knowledge and I guess te practical techniques uh, from that particular field and integrating that into visual arts education. And so upon finishing my master's uh, in education, I, I met with my supervisors, which is uh, Dr. Jill Smith and Dr. Graham McPhail. Uh, we discussed or established it towards the end that the title of the thesis would be Hitting the Street, uh, the Legitimation of Street Art and Visual Arts Education in New Zealand. And really, as I mentioned, we were exploring how we could bring something like street art uh, into visual arts education. So we established the research question, which was, in what ways is street art understood and legitimized as part of visual culture in New Zealand by its community of artists, visual arts educators and students? And what are the implications of legitimizing this art form in visual arts programs at secondary schools and tertiary institutions? And so as I started um, the kind of initial conversation with my supervisors, what we kind of established was this idea of street art being this uh, informal, type of knowledge which has been developed uh, for, for all of these uh, kind of decades in the street uh, and compared to the formal knowledge which is uh, more prevalent in the institution and you know the canon of visual arts or, or art history. Um, so really it was exploring how something like street art could fit in um, to that formal knowledge space uh, and be included into the canon, uh, particularly because it's, it's such a globalized art movement uh, of the 21st century. So uh, it wasn't obviously an art movement that's just prevalent in New Zealand, but also really across the whole world. So after I was introduced to uh, LCT, I obviously started reading a lot of the literature and, and, and theory and started understanding this idea or concept of horizontal and vertical discourse. And that was really, I guess, a useful way for me to distinguish these different um, knowledge types and how um, something like street art could uh, transition into visual arts education, at least at least theorize it. Um, and one of the main, I guess, dimensions of LCT that I applied into th the theory of my thesis was specialization codes. And that really, this particular dimension enabled me to be able to identify um, and theorize all the dispositions of the street artists that I interviewed, the teachers and, and their students. So. Um, getting their kind of perspectives really enabled me to understand uh, rather than kind of at a descriptive level uh, but a more anal analytical level to identify some of the challenges limitations and implications of including street art into, into the visual arts education space and really some of the things that people were saying were um, you know oh the introduction of you know street art and graffiti into the curriculum might make the school look ghetto um, that was some of the um, voices of the participant, particularly the teachers, in terms of what they said about um, including some of, of street art into the, into the teaching program. And so for me, being able to identify limitations like that is kind of understanding how the teachers perceive this particular type of knowledge and that potentially being an obstacle for its inclusion into, uh, into the curriculum. Uh, as well as that, um, Obviously, after finishing the PhD, uh, that was an incredible relief for it to all be done and, and have the name doctor 
uh, at the beginning of my name gave me a sense of, I guess, professionalism and responsibility because uh, upon completing this doctorate, I've, I've also studied many other things beforehand. And so that really marked a 14 and a half year journey for me, you know, studying at university uh, amongst working full time. So that was definitely a challenge to juggle both of those two things. But um, if there was any advice that I'd probably leave to postgrad students, it would really be the power of um, contribution in terms of your research and the ability to build knowledge um, for other academics and, and know that you're obviously contributing something incredibly important through your research and being able to, I guess, for me, particularly in New Zealand, I, I feel like there isn't enough uh, educational research in the visual arts space. So to know that I've contributed to that community is really important. And obviously, last thing is to challenge yourself, um, not just in the academic space, but to um, once you're finished, you know, you can carry on conducting your research and, and know that you're making an impact with what you do. Hi, my name is Jack Walton. Um, my PhD looked at educational assessment in university level music education with a particular focus on practices for assessing musical performance work um, in the university setting. And the motivation behind the study was really my undergraduate experience as a music student and a curiosity that kind of came out of this about this kind of tension that seemed to exist between the artistic purposes of my music studies and what felt like a kind of formal really less artistic process of evaluation that still seemed to rely very heavily on subjective interpretation by musical experts. So I was interested to know how this really worked and under what conditions it could be said to work and also how people that's music staff and students actually felt about the place of assessment in music education and LCT itself really shaped the way the study developed in that it provided some ways to make sense of assessment practices as a whole. So while we can look at the assessment of students work with those same concepts, if we zoom out a bit to look at the practice of assessment as a whole, those concepts can be used to look at other forms of legitimation that might be going on in and around um, the legitimation of students work. So the entry point was definitely specialization, which seemed like a really natural fit given the focus on assessment. But by the end of the study, autonomy had come along and LCT had really become something I was able to think with a bit more freely. And so if you were to go and read the thesis, you'll find bits of every dimension peppered through it. And you know, in some cases that was really some light touch content from semantics to help structure some ideas in the earlier chapters. And then by the second to last chapter, I couldn't really avoid shifting from specialization into autonomy. And for me, one of the most exciting aspects of my study was this meeting point between those dimensions that it could show how the legitimation of students work, which is that thing that we focus on most of the time in assessment and studies of assessment, is really just one process of legitimation that makes up an assessment practice as a whole. And actually what happens in assessment is really framed also by the legitimacy of assessors themselves, of their place within the discipline, in my case, within the discipline of music, and of the discourse or discourses that they are most aligned with or against, which really, really matters when the musical and the educational or the evaluative discourses are set up in opposition to each other. And we end up with people being asked to perform in ways that don't always align with their values. And I mean, not only perform music, but perform assessment as well. So music education sometimes risks becoming almost an oxymoron under the wrong conditions. And by the end, it was really clear to me that the study had been about locating this tension. And that was sort of the you know, hearkening back to where I started as a, an undergraduate student really helped to explain a kind of tacit um, feeling of tension and kind of curiosity at the same time that I, that I felt. Um, 
getting through the study was really tough at points and cultivating, I think, friendships within the LCT community was really important for me. In hindsight, I really undervalued that through the middle of my candidature, especially, and it's so helpful and validating to have a group of people with whom you can really get into your work with, but in a low stakes way that promotes testing out ideas and calibrating your thinking. That definitely got me through the end. Certainly having also colleagues and friends um, doing their own research in music was um, a great counterpoint as well, but having that theoretical community was really helpful. So ultimately I feel really lucky to have had the opportunity to do the work and I'm enjoying picking up the threads um, kind of as we speak. So thanks very much for your time. Hello, good morning here. Um, my name is Vicky Arisa Pinzon. I'm from Mexico. And this time I would like to talk about this PhD process. And I, I love this idea of PhD celebration because uh, after so much work, there are definitely things um, we need to celebrate. <clears throat> well, um, I started um, this study. I will tell you briefly, uh, of course, this is not the whole study, but I'm, I'm interested in writing, academic writing. And I work in a, in a school of uh, teacher education and students at the end of their career, they have to write a, a thesis in English. Um, that has been like, or sometimes it, this is a complicated process <clears throat> and I was wondering why and why does it cause so much struggle in students? So I combined uh, some tools from systemic functional linguistic and uh, LCT and I did different analysis, but this one is just about grammatical metaphor, which uh, analyzes the complexity of the writing. And what I found out is that in the in the thesis, because I analyzed thesis, the introduction of, of master thesis, I found out find out that uh, the, the wave is relatively slow. And I also noticed that students write a lot from or a lot from their experience and a lot of about their experience. So that was really interesting to find out because <clears throat> I also learned that this is probably a, a, a characteristic of the field of English language teaching and education. And uh, well, that's basically in a nutshell what I did. I was really, I really loved it, this work and that helped me to understand my field much better and work with other things right now. But understanding the field, that's really interesting and that, I, um, you know, gives you a lot of sense of where you are and what are the needs, what are the struggles and how can you help students to write with a purpose and also to, to make them um, access other types of knowledge beyond the, their experience that they express in their thesis. Well, that's basically my study. And now, you know, I would like to say that uh, that moment when you finished, it, it's really strange when people start calling you doctor. And at the beginning, I, I was really shy uh, to listen to people. And I, I, I even said, don't call me doctor or call me whatever you want, call me teacher. But then um, after thinking and talking to people, it's like, okay, it, it's another, you know, try to uh, embrace that you are a doctor. One of my friends told me, uh, you work a lot, so you deserve it. So next time that somebody calls you doctor, say, yes, thanks. And that's how I accepted, you know, that new identity of being called doctor. Uh, I, I know sometimes it's a lot of responsibility, but I like it and, and LCT is helping me. And uh, now that, um, you know, uh, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, moving from being a teacher to being a, do a doctor is because of the hard work that we do. And I wanted to show you this picture that was really meaningful. And this is one of my favorites. Uh, I don't know if you can see our faces, my supervisor and my face, and of course, Jagan behind clapping. That was really beautiful. But look at me, I'm like with a 
sense of relief uh, after the hard work and after the, you know, all, all the struggles that I myself went through writing a thesis. So that was really a huge moment. And that's really when I, what I value about it. Also, um, I would like to share other pictures. I'm not sure how uh, writing is in other parts of the world, but here in Mexico, it's a family moment. Here in the pictures, you can see friends and family coming to my exam. Um, I was not sure uh, if they understand what I say, said because I uh, the presentation was in English, but I could just see their proud faces. And that was really a um, huge motivation for me. And I was really, I got that sense of accomplishment. Well, and then uh, also thank you for this opportunity to share about, um, about our thesis because, you know, uh, um, I wrote an acknowledgement in my thesis and I'm not sure if, if they read it because sometimes, you know, thesis go to the, to the library and I'm not sure if they read it, but I made a thank you note for the LCT community and I want to read it now um, so that you can get engaged and be sure that this community is helpful and that also encouraged me to finish this work. So it says a special mention to the LCT group in North America and to the international community well represented by Professor Carl Mayton. Thanks. And uh, well, that's a lot. This is like a presentation and I hope that you get uh, encouraged and motivated to finish your own thesis. Thank you. Greetings to the LCT community. Um, I'm Liesl Hudson from the Cape Peninsula University of Technology here in Belleville, Cape Town. Welcome and thank you for the opportunity to share my PhD experience and also to celebrate um, having that, acquiring that achievement. So I'm, I embarked on my doctoral journey wanting to know why certain radiation physics concepts are difficult and differently interpret, interpreted by uh, students and then also how do they, why do they transfer these interpretations in a different manner when they go to the clinical practice. So in terms of the real world problem, it was this widening uh, theory practice gap that I investigated. But in terms of the research problem, I wanted to know why students struggled to grasp certain concepts in the classroom. And then when they transfer and apply it to um, practice, why is that application even different? So I initially I looked at Maya and Land's threshold concept framework, and then I decided no, this I can't use it on its own. So I combined it with LCT specialization dimension as an analytical lens to see how threshold concepts in radiation physics were enacted in theory-based and clinical practices, and by which um, role players, actors, who, who enact that. So um, languages of descriptions for threshold concepts were therefore developed and using the specialization dimension. And then after the examination period, one examiner wasn't so happy. So we had to change it because the person thought that semantics will be a much better lens um, and dimension to address my research problem. So a revised thesis was then developed using semantics and in particular epistemic semantic um, uh, gravity, ESG. And uh, what was difficult was the thesis was then passed and examined using one dimension and uh, the, a book chapter was developed using the specialization di dimension. So ultimately in my journey, I used two dimensions, but in the thesis domain, it's ESG, and in a different output, it's specialization. And this shows the versatility of LCT overall, um, the whole toolkit, but to me personally, it showed a vast interpretation and application of the theory itself, 
and at whichever level of, of abstraction you can and want to use it. A major finding, therefore, was that the identified threshold concepts underpin safe and competent radiation practice, so that was really comforting. And with uh, semantics, in particular ESG, epistemic semantic gravity, we could then shed light on um, different concepts. And five pedagogies were therefore proposed as a result from my findings for the cumulative, cumulative learning of the identified racial concepts. In terms of being addressed after all those heartache and pain, um, how did it feel to be addressed as a doctor initially? Well, I felt I couldn't own the title, to be really honest. Um, with lots of comments initially to change, when are you going to change your signature? When are you going to answer the phone as Dr. Hudson? So, um, because I, I just felt I couldn't own, own it yet. I don't know why. Until one day I received a call from um, someone at our institution and very kindly and also in a motherly way, she told me that I should be using my title. I should be proud of it. And by doing so, I will acknowledge and also celebrate the hard work and painful experiences that went into um, coming up with not only the thesis, but the scholarship as well. So from my side, after that conversation, I decided, okay, very subtly and softly, uh, silently, I will start using it, but I'm now using it very proudly because she also said that you are celebrating your supervisors and their hard work and time that they invested in developing you as a scholar. So, yes, in, when I decided to use it, it was initially for me, but over time, it's also just to, to thank them that they can also have that same level of, of proudness. So one, you can't only give one um, item or one uh, piece of advice for, for scholars, but even though it might sound cliched, I think I would tell people who is on this journey or want to embark on the journey to just persevere, to stick it out, to see it through, irrespective of what life throws you, um, what that inner voice tells you, but just see it through. And uh, that's an emotion that comes to mind when I, I hear support giving to, 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 to other scholars. But in terms of advice you don't underestimate the support systems and um, structures that you have and that you also build up especially the network structures within those support systems so with it your family the numerous how to how to write a proposal how to publish how to all those how to workshops and web webinars nowadays stick it out see it through and all, what I found, especially um, initially when I, when I first used LCT, it was so new to me, it was actually scary. But the LCT roundtables and also something that we tried um, here in South Africa, that really helped me not only to speak the lingo, but also to really understand and to own whatever dimension I tried to use. So yeah, go ahead, enjoy it. I uh, also enjoyed the, the downs more than the ups. So all the best. Thank you so much. Hi. Hello. My name is uh, Kevin Nube from South Africa. Um, I had been uh, lecturing marketing since 2009 when I started my PhD in 2014. Uh, I was lecturing in Cape Town, South Africa, and I had had opportunities to lecture in Germany, in Rwanda, uh, Zambia, and I had also lectured students from across um, uh, the globe, including from China and Russia. And I had become increasingly concerned as an educator in South Africa about who succeeds, uh, how they succeed, who fails, and uh, who drops out. It is for this reason that I... Uh, I undertook my PhD and used uh, LCT. 
Okay, so what I then uh, sought to ask were questions on the knowledge privileged in the curriculum, uh, the positioning of actors in the field of uh, marketing education, and how this positioning affected the choice and structure of knowledge privileged in the curriculum. And of course, above all this was uh, how all this affected student success. And the tools I used, I actually used as many tools uh, to underpin my study. So if you read through my study, you'll hear epistemic, the epistemic plane, semant semantic profile. You also find something on autonomy. But I think the main ones really were specialization and the social plane. Now, um, in my data, um, uh, the, the data demonstrated that the marketing curriculum was uh, more of a, a NOAA code. It had the dominant NOAA code, and thus was shown in the valuing of um, um, a number of things. Uh, for example, uh, English, that it had to be spoken quite well. Uh, but it looked as if, as you look closely, you found that English was actually used as a proxy for social class, that the students that were required in the curriculum had to come from a particular social class and that they had to come from a particular race. Uh, this was unfortunate, uh, but it is re re representative of uh, this unfortunate situation in South Africa. And this all came out in the data. This wasn't some, that's not something that's obvious uh, prior to the uh, research. Okay. Uh, so I think here, just going through this, um, and I think another important thing was that came from the data was that the students were actually expected to have this um, NOAA code or this NOAA gaze, this marketing gaze before entering the curriculum. And the knowledges were not structured uh, to actually teach uh, this uh, gaze. Um, okay, the doctor title. Hmm, I'm not very big on titles, but um, I think the first times that I was called doctor, it was very clear to me that um, the person, the persons calling me uh, understood this as a, collect, a success for the collective and a shared success. And for that reason, uh, yeah, I was, I understood it, but uh, I'm not somebody who is quite uh, big on titles. All right, um, encouragement to postgraduates uh, from my own PhD experience. I think um, um, as a PhD student, you've got to understand that uh, the beginning of the thesis sounds very logical. You'll do a lit lit literature review, um, uh, maybe a proposal at some point, a uh, theoretical framework, data analysis, conclusion, and then you edit, and that should be done. But actually, as you do it, to understand that chaos will come in, data will come in, and to throw you all over. And this findings I'm telling you sounds very logical, sounds very, but uh, you know, you have to go through a period of, uh, of some sort of chaos, uh, hang on in there. And uh, at some point, the last beat really is actually organizing this so that other people can understand. My big encouragement is that you share ex ex uh, experiences with those behind us, they really need that. Okay, from my side, it is a big thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Dale Langsford. I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa, and I completed my PhD through the University of the Witwatersrand last year in 2020. My um, research was about making sense of how teachers talk about teaching. Um, and I looked at what pedagogic reasoning, which is the specialized way in which teachers make decisions in every lesson that they teach, what does that look like? And specifically, I was looking at how differently qualified teachers talk about their teaching um, with the goal of trying to find out what this pedagogic reasoning actually looks like. So I used LCT, I've used um, in three ways. I used the semantics dimension um, in which I used semantic gravity to analyze the context boundedness of how, of, of how the student, the, the participants spoke about teaching. I used semantic density to analyze the complexity of how they speak about teaching. I used the specialization dimension to analyze whether the teacher talk was foregrounding or backgrounding 
what the teacher knows and can do, or and I use some uh, social relations to analyze um, whether the teacher talk was foregrounding or backgrounding who the teacher is and should be, so their dispositions. And I used the interactional relations from the social plane to analyze the, whether the, the participants uh, felt that the criteria for good teaching, where they'd learned that that was important. So here's just one of the findings from my study. Um, and, and this is where I used semantic density to analyze the differences in complexity of how teachers talk about practice. And this is just some data from two of the groups that I analyzed. The group on the left, as you can see, speak, they don't, they, they speak mainly about one topic in depth. They really go into great depth about one topic, um, relating it and networking it with other topics occasionally, but they really show great uh, depth in, in terms of talking about that one topic of lesson introductions. The group on the right network the, the main idea that they're talking about with many other ideas, important ideas about teaching um, to form this sophisticated network of complexity um, to show how all these different ideas of teaching impact uh, one another and form this network of the complexity of teaching as a practice. The first time I was called doctor was a little bit unexpected because my brother, who's my financial advisor, had signed me up for a new policy and had filled in all the, the forms with doctor and I didn't know that he'd done that and then the the company phoned me and addressed me as doctor and I just felt this um sort of uh, jump in leap in my tummy and this wave of gratitude just uh washed over me it was like I've done it I'm I'm here and um, it was just the most fantastic experience. Uh, my graduation was earlier this uh, in 2021. Um, I graduated at home because we couldn't have an in-person graduation. So here's some photos um, from that celebration that I had with, uh, with my family. And if I could share something with students who are currently pursuing postgraduate study, um, there's so many practical tips that we, one could give, but something that really stood with me and carried me through this journey um, was this phrase, to confidently expect victory. When you're expecting something, you orientate yourself towards it. And um, so choose victory, orient yourself towards victory, whether you... Um, stumble, whether you have a, a difficult time, keep yourself oriented um, towards victory. And if you are working hard and consistently and always doing your best, no matter what your best looks like within your circumstances, you can confidently have that expectation that you will be victorious. Thank you. My name is Sharon Ayres um, and I was the PhD student of Professor Carl Mayton. So I got very fortunate in my supervision. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today just about a little bit about my PhD, about me um, and uh, some cool stuff I got to do with specialization, which was the legitimation code I used. So 
The first thing I guess I wanted to talk about was how do you choose a topic and, and why did I choose what I did? Well, this, this isn't how it looks on my thesis that's lodged in the university. But uh, in some ways, this is what my thesis was ultimately about. And I'm calling it who wins the school game here. Um, and I was really interested in the idea of education and inequality and the role that families play in this. And not so much, you know, what families might be doing right or wrong, which is how it's often characterised or how families might be stuck in a certain social class and can't escape that. I really wanted to understand what are the kinds of relationships families have with schools. And I chose the moment of high school choice as the one to focus on for my research. How did I get to that point? Well, you can see there, that is a photo of my daughter. And that was pretty much around the age I was being asked by some of my family members what high school are you going to, have you put her down for? This was pretty much the last question I ever expected to get. But it obviously mattered very much to them. And that got me thinking, why is high school choice so important to some people? And what are they trying to get out of making a big deal of it, especially when I've got someone so young? So that set me on this idea of that maybe high school choice is seen as a trajectory for people and some families might have a lot of strategy around that. So that's how I started to formulate the research topic. And my daughter was a few years on from that when I started it. But I guess the other thing I should tell you is this took me nearly 10 years to finish. So please don't ever give up. The research questions I focused on were what do parents want from high schools and why? How does this compare with how the system is meant to work? And what clues might this give us into understanding advantage and disadvantage in schooling? A tiny bit of context for my research. Schooling in Australia can be understood to be segmentalized, stratified and residualized. What I mean by that is segmentalized, one in three students in Australia will attend a private high school. What's more, in New South Wales, where I'm based, there's a very high number of public school selective schools where if you do well in certain exams, you get to go into an academically selective school or selective school stream. And unsurprisingly, these are the students and schools that have the highest higher school certificate, the leaving certificate rankings. It's also highly stratified in that um, the difference between the student in the most advantaged school and the student in the least advantaged school or the most disadvantaged school by the end of schooling is about three years, which is the, an incredible range of educational experience. The last thing is to say it's very residualized. We know students and schools that have the least advantaged students that experience the most disadvantage um, have higher student teacher ratios, they um, have less resources and they really find it much harder to fill the teaching positions. So disadvantage is very baked in and sort of visible in the system. So I went and interviewed parents as a big part of my study. And what I was doing uh, when I started to write this up is characterize the different kinds of groups of parents based on what they wanted from their schooling uh, for their children. And I described four different groups. I described one group who are, what are called here credentialists. They wanted their children to achieve very highly, get high marks. Socially disposed parents wanted their children to be happy in school. All rounders wanted a bit of both of those and particularly looked to their children getting excellence in certain areas that were both social and relevant for the workplace, as well as you know, assuming that they'll go to uni. And then there were consolidators who really came from often a migrant background and talked about building, you know, upon their parents and grandparents' success and, and wanting to have a lot of harmony between school, home, and often the church they were involved with. But the problem was, what do you do with four groups? How do I make this comparable? And this is where specialization came in. Specialization, as you would be aware, um, divides the um, relations into epistemic relations and social relations. And these enabled me to get a grip on what 
kind of things are being compared between parents. In my case, and there you can see this is how we understand specialisation between really a question of what you know or who you are. In my case, um, specialisation, epistemic relations for me was all about how much academic achievement parents expected for their children. And this was a scale I could put on epistemic relations. Likewise, with social relations, in my case, this is about social skills. And again, I could put a, sc a scale on how much parents emphasised social development and social leadership in schooling and from schooling. This actually enabled me to then plot all these parent groups on the specialisation plane. Credentialists were very knowledge-based. Socially disposed parents were very what we'd call knowery. All rounders were elite, they wanted both and consolidators fell in the middle. So I had a way of comparing the different parent groups. Why, you know, what did it mean to become a doctor? Well, I didn't get to have a graduation because I graduated in COVID. So I don't have a picture of me with Professor Carl Mayton. But because I work at a college, we did have graduations. And this is the first time I'm wearing doctoral robes and I'm there with the dean and the college um, manager. So I am pretty happy. So I guess I said earlier at the start, this took me 10 years. So I guess my big message is don't give up and everyone finds it hard. And the thing that really got me through more than anything else was finding a community of practice. So I got really fortunate. I went through not only in Sydney where there was the LCT round table that I could regularly go to, but I had a cohort of other PhD um, students going through with me and we formed LCT OG and we got together first as a reading group that turned into a writing group. And in the end, it was a draft reading group for all of our theses. And that is, I think, probably the biggest factor that in the end got me over the line across that 10 years. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Susie Cowley Hazelden and I work at the University of Warwick in the UK. And uh, literally just, just over two weeks ago, I passed my PhD viva with minor corrections and um, I studied at Coventry University in the UK for my PhD. Um, the title of my thesis is uh, Knowledge Building via Academic Reading Circles on an English for Academic Purposes pre-sessional course and basically um, kind of at the heart of my thesis is, is trying to contribute some way to um, mitigating knowledge blindness in EAP particularly in the classroom where we focus on language and skills at the expense of, of developing any um, academic knowledge. And in particular, I was interested in um, developing students' understanding or, or knowledge, sorry, of theory um, and what I termed theory knowledge ability, not just understanding what theory is and how it's applied, but also understanding of a particular theory itself. So I wanted to explore what happens um, when postgraduate pre-sessional students take part in a, a series of academic reading circles that were designed to develop theory knowledgeability. And the premise was that theory knowledgeability was, was a bit of a threshold concept. It was quite challenging and troublesome to acquire and, and sort of required some change, some transformation um, in the students in, in order to acquire it. So a sort of second research question really was looking at whether this academic reading circle process could help students traverse what's known as the liminal space, this sort of troublesome space trying to acquire this, this uh, concept or the, trying to acquire theory knowledgeability. So uh, in order to answer my research questions, I um, employed semantics um, and I uh, transcribed the um, the, uh, the academic reading circle discussions, group discussions, and analyze those for um, and plotted a semantic profile. So use semantic gravity to look at how far the discussions remained grounded in the text the students were discussing and how far they were able to, to move beyond that context. And rather than um, you, uh, plotting semantic density on that profile, I actually opted to look at um, epistemic condensation 
and very much borrowed from um, Lambrimos's study that with her visualization of, of epistemic condensation um, because it showed it, it was a better way of visualizing or showing how students co-constructed that knowledge of, of theory knowledgeability. So that was the main data. I did use um, specialization to some degree as well for some other other data that I acquired outside of the discussions, but they were they, that was sort of, I guess, the, the, the meat of the thesis, if you like. And I think in terms of interesting findings, I think the best thing maybe is to um, look at a few quotes from the students. Um, I, I guess the, the for me that the most interesting finding was that this process did enable students to acquire theory knowledgeability, at least as a group. So they were able to sort of co-construct um, an understanding of what theory is, how it's applied, and, and an understanding of the given theory itself. Um, so some of these quotes show that actually before the process, students feel very stuck um, and, you know, they might be able to define theory, but do not really know what it is. And even if they had encountered theory before in previous studies, that this process sort of made them realise that actually it's not just something you read about in a book, but you actually apply it to real life situations um, and, and it sort of changed their way of thinking. Um, it also gave students a lot more confidence and, and they talked about bravery as well um, in talking about um, sort of academic concepts, um, which was pretty cool. Um, my, my experience my, of my journey as a doctor um, has been very much a love-hate relationship. Um, there have been times when I have loved the whole process uh, and kind of felt worthy of it, and there have been times when I just... Uh, it felt so pointless and that it would not contribute in any way to the field and, you know, um, I was just sort of wasting um, time and energy. Um, so I think the biggest, uh, the most negative aspect of my experience of, of the doctoral journey really has been the impact on my children uh, and the guilt. Um, but actually, now that I'm through it now, I'm, I'm sort of the other side now. Um, I'm so, so pleased that, that I did do it and it has actually been been worth it, but it still won't get me eaten marmite, that's for sure. I think one thing that I've learned and I'll, I'll sort of take away from the whole PhD process, quite, <laughs> I know this is an issue for a lot of people, this sort of sense of imposter syndrome, but quite, I was very reluctant, very reticent to sort of talk to other people that I didn't know about my work and sort of very tentatively dipped my toe in the water um, but actually through the viva and through sort of annual progress review panels that were kind of like a mini viva I really came to relish those conversations and I wish perhaps that I'd sort of dived in a little bit more and exposed myself to situations to talk more about my work. Um, thank you. <laughs>
translation devices can be operationalized or dynamized from the perspective of sociology of education towards disciplinary knowledge and practices or vice versa. So in my PhD study, I looked at curriculum alignment from the perspective of chemistry. And I worked from that direction towards translation devices for analyzing curriculum data. Some details about my PhD study. The title is a semantic gravity perspective on South African school chemistry curriculum alignment. The research problem that motivated my undertaking the study was that there's a need for defining discipline specific curriculum literacies and for identifying implicit literacy practices in chemistry curriculum. So the particular LCT tool that was useful to me in the study was semantic gravity. And that's because I focused on the discourse aspect of abstraction in chemistry. Some interesting findings from the study include that there was an overall high level of alignment for visual uh, chemistry literacy demands and for textual chemistry literacy demands, but at the lower levels of abstraction. The visual literacy demands were found to be higher than the textual ones, but the thesis argued that while exploring alignment of the visual and textual curriculum literacy demands across the curriculum texts was useful, it was equally important to consider how evenly the visual and textual items were actually distributed across the semantic gravity continuum. And that is because in this courses such as chemistry, we're aiming for students to climb the ladder of abstraction. So how does it feel to, to be a PhD, to graduate uh, from a PhD degree? I don't yet know 100% because my formal graduation at UKZN is next week. That's why I don't have a graduation picture to share with you. What I can tell you is that I'm aware the title of, of doctor is meaningful in the society that we live in. Having a doctorate is associated with being able to solve real world problems um, for the broader society. And so I'm aware of the significance of having those letters. I've seen the PhD as a process rather than as a final event. And so for me, the, the value of the PhD isn't just something that will come with the graduation, but it's the learning that I've been able to do along the way. Advice for postgrad students. I think there's a few things that I can share for those of you who are still undertaking this journey. Firstly, have ongoing conversations with different researchers, particularly researchers using LCT, if your, your study has been framed by LCT, but also with other researchers like those in your discipline who might not be familiar with LCT. It's really important to keep the conversations going through the course of your degree. I also think that it's really important to write as you are reading so that you capture whatever it is that you're reading and its relevance for your study. You need to be able to do this both in terms of breadth and depth. Another tip is that instead of working overtime in the time that you registered for your PhD, it's really important for you to devote as much after hours time as possible to completion of the PhD for that ongoing conversation. Try to maintain a devoted PhD workspace, a space that you can dedicate to your readings, your books, your laptop, in which you don't need to pack up um, regularly. That's quite important for maintaining that continuity. Actively seek out and maintain support systems. And lastly, most importantly, don't give up. Um, some acknowledgements. I like to acknowledge family and friends that formed my own support system through the journey of my PhD, the supervisors, Prof. Carol Bertram and Dr. Doris Sibanda, the Rhodes University D DVC of Research and Innovation, Dr. Peter Clayton, and also the Canon Collins Educational and Legal Assistance Trust, and the NRF Black Academic Advancement Program. Thank you. Greetings from a very beautiful Durban in South Africa. My name is Shobha Rathilal. I'm happy to add doctor as of last year. 
I completed my PhD at the University of KwaZulu-Natal under the supervision of Professor Wayne Hugo. My thesis was titled Planning for Numeracy in Higher Education, a South African University of Technology case study. Uh, I was interested in understanding how numeracy was planned for in the curriculum and why it was done in these particular ways. I looked at it from two angles, that of conceptions of numeracy being held at the institution and these other forces that act on curriculum choices. I looked I used all five dimensions of uh, LCT, but I'm only going to share with you uh, my analysis in terms of the specialization and semantics in understanding the conceptions of numeracy. I found that participants found it difficult to share what numeracy actually is or what being numerate was. Uh, they did use the terms, but couldn't share or explain it. They did share examples and I used these examples against um, doing the analysis of using specialization and semantics. I found that the examples had strong uh, semantic density and strong semantic gravity as well. There were other instances, but this was the dominant space. In terms of specialization, I found that most of the examples actually featured a lot in the relativist code, but that the examples were different in that for it to be that kind of common sense, there was an expectation that uh, students would have mastered certain knowledges and uh, ways of being, and this would become implicit. So it was in the relativist code, but it did expect uh, a building of knowledge, specialized knowledge, knower building, and continuously evolving to this renewed common, uh, renewed numeracy sense, which I eventually defined in my study. Um, I want to just take a couple minutes to share with you my experience. I found it very interesting, sometimes overwhelming as well. Uh, I had a lot of emotions uh, or, or attitudes. I was arrogant. Sometimes I felt stupid. I was bored. Um, there was relief at the end and of course excitement with the results. But I just want to share with colleagues some things that might influence your studies as well. It did mine. I had to come to a realization that the PhD was a qualification, so it had exit level criteria. And to get that PhD, I needed to meet those exit level criteria and then go beyond or whatever. But I had to meet that criteria. I was also arrogant sometimes when I read thesis and said, oh, this was such a simple piece of work. If that's a thesis, I can get 10. But um, I had to, I came to the realization that uh, a thesis that's uh, easily understood is not a simple thesis. It's not a reflection of the amount of work that goes into producing such a thesis. It's actually a good representation. I also found a time where I couldn't wing it or I shouldn't be winging it um, with my cohort for, uh, facilitators or my colleagues or my supervisor, but that I needed to share with them how I was thinking and listen to their input, take what worked and, and Park what didn't. Um, I needed to know also that the PhD was a long journey. So for me, what eventually worked was that I had to break that journey in smaller targets and I celebrated everything. I celebrated every target that I met. Uh, it felt like I was doing, you know, having the quick wins uh, because I was often tempted to get consumed with things that had quicker wins. Um, I also had to accept that what I was putting out could be contested. Um, that it could be disproved or, or the studies could challenge it. But for this time, this was the best representation of the phenomena. Uh, I did have to make sacrifices, but you know, I had to take some things off my full plate, uh, but I just needed to make sure that what I took off my plate wasn't the things that were most important to me. And for me, family, friends and, and being there was very important and I, I maintained that. And therefore, I was able to celebrate that PhD with the family and friends and colleagues that I um, was happy to be part of. So good luck, colleagues, on your journey as well. My name is Mlamuli Shachwayo, and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of KwaZulu Natal, Hoop Hoop, one of the best universities uh, in the country, and I dare say in the world. Uh, my research, my PhD research, was on 
um, exploring and theorizing the way that knowledge and knowers are legitimated uh, in the field of political studies. So I was really interested in that. And that was primarily because I think a couple of years ago, I was a teaching assistant in one of our department uh, meetings. Uh, we're debating with a senior colleague regarding to what extent is our curricula uh, uh, decolonized. And I think he just banged his hand uh, uh, in the table, uh, arguing that for him, the late English philosopher Thomas Hobbes was non-negotiable. So if he's not teaching, Hobbes is not teaching political uh, uh, studies. So that really set up this love for me to know and understand um, um, how knowledge is and knowers are uh, really valued and legitimated uh, within the field of uh, political studies. And really some of the LCT concepts that I relied on uh, 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 was the EPD, the Epistemic Pedagogical Divines, because I felt it was really useful to see the different ways that political studies uh, knowledge and knowers are legitimated from the field of production uh, uh, to the recontextualizing field as well as the field of reproduction. And to what extent there's that dialectical shift across the different kinds of fields and the different knowledges and knowers uh, that are valued across these different uh, 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 fields. What was interesting particularly about my study that I didn't even anticipate was that one of the interesting things about uh, political studies in general, but really specifically uh, the postgraduate diploma in political studies that I was analyzing, was that knowledge is not really necessarily uh, 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 and the is not really valued per se but it's really about the values the attributes and the disposition um um um, um, um that the that the students come to uh, the department with where there was a lot of uh, academics saying they don't really need to know this they don't need to know that i don't care about this theory but if i've got a motivated student if i've got a dedicated student if i've got a student who's willing to learn who can critique and challenge me and things like that that for me is my ideal political uh study student that for me is my ideal uh, Noah, if you like. So that was very, very interesting because for a very long time, I thought political studies was a very knowery field. And so to get a sense that it's also about the values, the attributes and the disposition uh, of the student, that for me was 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 very, very interesting. Um, how I experienced first time being called a doctor, I think it was Dr. Amanda Sengwa and Prof. Sumakina. Uh, we're preparing for our PhD celebration at Rhodes. And they started referring to this person calling Doc, 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 and it wouldn't sink into my mind that they were talking about me. So it took a while. My graduation was 2019, but even my students now calling me Doc still takes a while. Of course, my 85 year old grandmother, when she wants to mock me, uh, it's always so that's, that's been very, uh, very, very interesting uh, 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 in this journey. So something that I've learned um, during this PhD journey, really, it's um, I'm trying to strike a balance. And I know, I know, I know, I know, I'm really talking to myself now, trying to strike a balance between family as well as your studies. We really, really need that balance. During the course of my PhD, um, I've had fellow students now who just had depression, not feeling well, collapsing from their PhD and feeling like they're doing all the best that they can, but they're not getting um, um, the maximum benefit and others. And some of them even started getting divorced. Others were diagnosed with depression. So if you can try and get that balance as soon as you can, I think for me, that's, that's really the most uh, important thing. And finally, I think another important thing for me is having that teachable spirit. I know when your supervisor tells you that you need to kill your babies, you need to rewrite those sentences, you need to restructure that um, um, that chapter. And sometimes that chapter is like 42 pages. Then you feel like I've given my life to this chapter. So um, please have a teachable spirit. Yes, argue, engage, but also have that teachable spirit uh, to try and listen to advice. I'll stop over there. Thank you so much. myself. I am Dr. Kirsten Wilmot. I did my PhD at the University of Sydney from 2015 to the very beginning of 2019 and I was lucky enough to be supervised by Carl Mayton as my primary. I had Jagen, Lauren and Chrissy Bowie as my two co-supervisors. So my PhD looked at 25 gold standard or exemplary PhDs from South Africa in the humanities and social sciences. And the goal was to use LCT to understand 
how students build knowledge successfully through their dissertation in different ways according to different subject areas and discipline. So the tools that I used from LCT was specialization or a more broad brushstrokes analysis of what kind of knowledge and knowers were legitimated in different dissertations and then I used semantics to hone in on one aspect of the specialization analysis to have a look in a little bit more detail of how students built knowledge in ways that moved across different levels of context dependency and how they cumulatively built complexity over time in their dissertations. Some of the main findings from my PhD, using specialization, I came to realize that all PhDs in the social sciences and humanities comprise of five core elements. So they all establish a rationale, they all explain the phenomenon being studied, they all explain how the phenomenon was studied, they all construct new findings, and they all demonstrate an original contribution to knowledge. So that was a way into understanding how dissertations get built over time. Then using semantics, I zoomed in, as I said, on different levels of context dependency, looking at how students move between their data to interpretations and explanations of that data, and then to include and incorporate existing findings from the field, from existing literature, and then how they use theoretical concepts to abstract their findings out beyond their own research study site. And I've been using the semantic side, particularly the semantic gravity side, to develop a writing tool and I've actually been giving workshops at a range of South African universities for masters and doctoral candidates and they have found this writing tool incredibly useful. So that has been a really wonderful benefit from my PhD study. So then moving on to my doctoral journey, I found this journey really challenging, particularly being in a context that I didn't know until I arrived in Sydney. I'd never been there before. The LCT Centre being based there was key to my learning, but also quite a step up from what I was used to and quite a challenge when I first arrived. But I found this community to be incredibly stimulating and supportive and overall just found the doctoral journey a very rewarding one, both personally and intellectually. So unfortunately due to COVID and travel bans, I don't have a nice photo of me in my grad outfit, but this is a photo from the day that I submitted my PhD and that's in the quadrangle at the University of Sydney. A really, really happy day and a lot of relief going on in that photo. So that's a moment I'll hold on to for a long time to come. In terms of what I learned along the way in this PhD journey is that a peer group like I got to experience through S Club is an invaluable support mechanism. So here we are, the S Clubbers. If I can give any piece of advice to any new doctoral student, it is to find a peer group where you can bounce ideas off, where you can break ideas and where you can rebuild ideas in better ways and stronger ways in order to produce a quality piece of work. Dominique Fagan from Cape Town, South Africa. A bit about me. I have a background in information communication technologies and also a passion for education. At the start of this journey, I worked in a university in a faculty where they trained student teachers to integrate ICTs in education. With this hype around ICTs in education all around, I wanted to understand how ICTs when integrated into the classroom facilitated epistemological access. However, I wanted to move beyond mere physical access to meaningful access to knowledge. So I moved with the assumption that these future teachers through their pedagogic practices could either reproduce or interrupt educational inequalities. In other words, how the teacher used technologies could either 
positively or negatively impact the knowledge transfer. My focus was on disadvantaged schools equipped with technology um, and specifically student teachers teaching science subjects. I used the semantics dimension of LCTs, in particular semantic density. Then I also used semantic waves, if any, to graphically represent epistemological axes during the lesson. An interesting finding from my study was that although student teachers were trying to use ICTs to open up knowledge in the classroom, in some instances, ICTs were simply used to simplify concepts and to teach context-dependent knowledge. Learners were therefore exposed to segmented, non-specialized, everyday knowledge. Student teachers also did not know how to make connections to indigenous knowledge systems. An isolated lesson found traces of semantic waves where the student teacher was able to guide the learners between simpler understandings and deeper abstract knowledge. So how did I feel when I was first addressed as doctor? Super chuffed. It instantly made all the sleepless nights and sacrifices worth it. I still can't help smiling. At the first doctor in my family raised by a single parent, I was truly proud of this achievement. I've learned through this um, process that you can do it. Um, so keep on going. When you feel discouraged or overwhelmed, take a break and do something you love. Especially those days or weeks where you have a mental block or you just cannot see another literature review. Don't guilt yourself. You need to find a routine that works for you. There's going to be good days, slow days and just days where you feel you are getting nowhere. Um, take a break and carry on. I had an amazing supervisor who gave me prompt feedback. I mean two days maximum. I used to joke with him to please give me a couple more days to relax while you work through my chapters. So you need to be able to speak to your supervisor. Don't get discouraged at corrections. Actioning those corrections is part of the progress and it's one step or move closer to completion. Lastly, um, enjoy this journey because everyone's journey is really um, different and it's worth it at the end of the day. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Oesterling. I'm in Stockholm University and I, and I defended my thesis in March this year. Um, my, in my work as a teacher educator, I found out that some things we did did not work out as intended. As an example, the task you can see here, state your expectations and goal for this practicum course. This task sometimes worked well for some students. We gave this task in the beginning of the practicum course. Some students gave us really nice responses what they wanted to achieve as teachers. Others gave us really vague responses. So I realized that the, perhaps our practices in teacher education did not work out as well for all students as it could have. Uh, and as uh, one of the things I could see in my first study was that knowledge in teacher education was not very explicit a lot of the knowledge in teacher education was invisible. And that's why I found I could help, find some help in the LCT framework uh, and the parts that talks about epistemic access and access to knowledge. So what I did was that I used the epistemic relations uh, and where, where I could see that the basis for legitimation was very unclear in this kind of questions. The knowledge was hidden both for students and for assessments. Uh, so if we look at this example, state your expectations and goals for this practicum course, I could see that the epistemic relations were very, uh, were 
were quite weakly uh, and not very uh, explicit. Also, uh, I also look at the social relations dimension. Uh, in this quote from the policy report on teacher education, it says men cease to be the majority of students in mathematics and science, whereas language programs had been and still are dominated by women. Of course, this is true, but the language used says something about how, uh, how teachers should be. It says something about it is that men are better and women are dominating and not so positively described. So the messages, uh, 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 the messages we take out from this is that, uh, that uh, men are much more positively described than women as mathematics teachers. And hence the social relations uh, dimension helped me to say that teachers are not only, that it's not only knowledge, but also who the teacher is, which is a basis of legitimation in teacher education and particularly in, in the policy parts of teacher education. Uh, and as a, a fact, uh, this is Anders, who was elected the Swedish Teacher of the Year in 2021. And I'm sure it's well deserved. And my, my results are of course not to be uh, used for, uh, my contribution is not to predict who will be the Teacher of the Year. It's rather to problematize how strong social relation decreases diversity and inclusion in teacher education. We find it very easy to see a young man happy like Anders as the teacher of the year. It's much more difficult to see perhaps an elderly woman as the teacher of the year for some very not very rational reason. So who the teacher is uh, also uh, uh, has uh, importance for legitimation in teacher education. I passed my defense in Zoom, as in this uh, uh, short movie. I really enjoyed discussing my thesis. I got really interesting questions and got to discuss my work in depth. And I really enjoyed that part of my thesis uh, uh, defense. So I, I encourage you to really take the opportunity to talk about your work. And for now, uh, coming out of the for hopefully coming out of on the other side of the pandemic. My advice for you is to really take the opportunity to, to connect to people, to be inspired and learn from your colleagues as we could do before the pandemic. So I hope I get to see you in real life soon. Hi, my name is AJ Jackson, and I'm a teacher at Montpelier High School in Montpelier, Vermont, in the United States. Uh, as an English teacher, uh, I'm interested in exploring literature with students and not only looking at the way that uh, their understandings and interpretations of the ideas uh, are supported with their textual evidence and the way that they uh, write but also their orientations to the value positions that are constructed in the text. And the way that these value positions uh, affect readers' uh, interactions with issues of civil and human rights in the world beyond the classroom. Uh, in the study that I uh, undertook for my dissertation, I wanted to understand the ways that students in an eighth grade subject English classroom, uh, which is called English Language Arts or ELA in the United States, um, I wanted to look at how students in this class uh, negotiated the value positions uh, as they undertook an analysis of passages from the Harry Potter novels. Uh, the Harry Potter novels being one of the most uh, acclaimed and famous uh, fantasy series um, uh, in literature. Um, the passages that we analyzed depicted the characters' attitudes towards enslavement in the wizarding world uh, that the magical and non-magical creatures inhabit. Um, the unit that I was analyzing was designed to help these students construct critical interpretations of the passages by critiquing Harry's role in Elvish enslavement. Uh, this literary analysis was in turn intended to help the students think critically about similar issues from history or from contemporary society. 
and how historical figures and others might be compared to Harry, Hermione, Ron, and the other characters uh, in the Harry Potter novels. The study was designed to see how success on the task related to two underlying principles, the forms of knowledge employed by the students uh, and the value positions that the students adopted towards the characters in relation to this issue of enslavement. Um, so in order to explore the forms of knowledge in the student writing, uh, I used the LCT concept of autonomy. So autonomy allowed me to distinguish between knowledge that either more or less directly related uh, to the target of the writing prompt, which was the character's attitudes towards enslavement. Uh, by analyzing the different forms of knowledge that students brought in, uh, this allowed me to understand how they used uh, information from beyond the writing prompt, so some of these references to history and culture, um, to support their interpretations and ultimately their judgments of the characters. Um, in, to complement that analysis, um, I used axiological constellation analysis to see how students uh, either align themselves with or disalign themselves with the ideas and characters in the text and how they position those characters and ideas in relation to one another. Analyzing the way positively and negatively charged constellations were built up in the student writing showed how students strengthened and weakened their evaluations or judgments of the characters in ways that sometimes downplayed particular attributes and sometimes emphasized others, depending on how strongly the writer praised or condemned the character. So one interesting finding from this study uh, was that what I found was students who were adopting this critical stance towards Harry and some of the other characters um, were more uh, likely to bring in information from history, history and uh, contemporary cultural events uh, to support their critical interpretations of Harry. Students who shied away from this uh, critique of Harry's character tended to kind of avoid those, uh, those connections. Um, and try to downplay uh, his negative attributes and emphasize his positive attributes. So that really showed that the connection between uh, what we see with autonomy, which is how different forms of knowledge are brought together, and the way that values are built up together through the axiological constellations, how those two factors really affected the student success on this task. So the first time that I was addressed as doctor, uh, it felt very surreal. Uh, it was hard to believe that I had finished because uh, in my mind, uh, so much was left unsaid and uh, I had learned so much. But in some ways, being called that just made me feel like I still have so much to learn and uh, made me feel very proud that I have gone through uh, what I did, but uh, still humble in the sense that I have a lot, a lot to learn. Um, my advice to anyone who's working through an advanced degree and, and using LCT to do that, which I highly recommend, um, is that sometimes you can't really grasp some of the concepts or some of the methods of analysis until you work through them many times. And sometimes a, it might take a different conceptual tool to get to past a particular problem. So I think LCT is wonderful because it allows you to analyze the same phenomenon from many different perspectives. So don't be afraid to try different methods to see what really opens up the data. I started my analysis with semantic gravity and semantic density, but neither of those concepts ended up in my dissertation. Uh, those analyses still informed my understanding of the data, uh, but the other concepts seem to illuminate my problem more completely. And finally, be sure to be involved in the LCT community in any way you can, whether this is through the conferences, online groups, or attending roundtables. Uh, the LCT community is incredibly welcoming and supportive. Uh, I really can't describe uh, the support that I felt throughout my uh, process uh, from people that were even on the other side of the world. So you don't have to go it alone. Uh, there are lots of interested people out there and they would love to help you. So make sure you uh, seek those people out. Thank you for being your interest in my study and uh, hello to all out there in LCT land.
I'm Dr. Fiona Jackson. I work in media studies. My study emerged from a bigger study where we were looking at major curriculum change in South African high schools. And an interesting early emergent finding was that in terms of using Bernsteinian concepts, particularly of classification and framing, we found the predominance of lessons across the big range of schools that we looked at strongly teacher fronted. The Bernsteinian concepts were not nuanced enough to fully um, describe the range of pedagogy that we um, witnessed in the classrooms we were we were observing. And so my particular interest is in was in subject English. Many aspects of it um, constitute a, often a very strongly invisible pedagogy and many student learners find it uh, very opaque um, to crack the code. So I was particularly interested in trying to understand how we could track the pedagogic teacher talk in the classrooms with su sufficient discriminatory nuance. I, I moved through a number of different theoretical lenses and I came to legitimation code theory concepts quite late in my journey and I particularly drew on um, the concepts of specialization and semantics and they did provide me in the end with the tools that could capture the range of the teacher talk with enough discriminatory subtlety. I think I went in with a bit of an assumption that subject English would most um, stereotypically sit quite firmly within um, the NOAA code um, of the epistemic plane, you know, where there would be generally be much stronger social relations relative to the epistemic relations. However, I saw evidence of very complex movements in strengths of epistemic and social relations in a couple of the lessons. And that often happened, um, say, in longer lessons and in, le in lessons where there, there was some continuity of um, focus, content focus over a few lessons where there was a sort of unit. And it was particularly the case in um, literature lessons. The movements could be very, very complex and interleaved, and that I didn't expect at the beginning of the study. So it was very interesting to see how complicated that could be. Um, and as I said, I discovered that attending to the focus and the basis of the relations in such les lessons turned out to be very important. You know, whether the focus is sort of what's what's the goal, the overall goal, um, sort of content-wise in this lesson, and the basis would often be well, what kind of pedagogic processes um, is the teacher employing at that particular moment? And the other thing that was interesting for me was that. I think I'd known intuitively over the years that that many existing binaries within the field of English language education were ultimately unhelpful, such as the traditional grammar approach versus the critical language teaching approach or the communicative language teaching approach. And such binaries are not that helpful for tracking the pedagogy, you know, what English teachers actually are doing in the classroom. And they're probably not that helpful for teachers setting out on their pedagogic journey um, because the ways and because teaching and learning are such intricate and complicated um, phenomena. One of the things I was personally most gratified to reach is reflected in this diagram, but it helped me to plot many of the different um, approaches to the teaching of subject English. The affordances of the semantic plane um, potentially allow subject English teachers to, to say, well, you know, at this particular point, where where am I placed and, and why? And, and how can I harness that insight most productively um, in relation to my students? 
research communities of practice are the best. I mean, a huge breakthrough in my PhD journey came when Sue McKenna at Rhodes University generously allowed me to join in um, the, the five day um, teaching series uh, that Carl Mayton presented there in 2012. And before that, I'd been very isolated on a limb in Maritzburg, and that 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 opportunity um, just catapulted my capacity to do my LCT analysis to a whole new level. And my other learning was that actually, you know, many catastrophes um, that happen can be worked around. Um, you know, I had I had lots of sort of data collecting catastrophes, um, which meant that my original neat case study plan um, couldn't uh, couldn't happen in the neat way that I'd envisaged. And that a lot of that was because of real life. So it's important not to let oneself be derailed when an immediate catastrophe presents itself to one. I'm Mandy Carver and this is me and this photograph was taken on my 60th birthday at a concert by Yo-Yo Ma which was a highlight of my life and I was just about to submit my PhD thesis at WITS um, in 2020 um, where I'm happy to say I'm, I'm, I graduated with my PhD last year. I'm a veteran music teacher, I've taught music from babies to preschoolers to senior school to tertiary education and I've always been fascinated by the connection between conceptual understanding of music and how we learn, how we learn to play, how we learn to understand music. So that relationship for me is key and I, I think it's a really difficult boundary to cross for many, many learners. So I've always been very interested in how that connection is made. My problem in my PhD was the South African music curriculum um, and it was a mismatch between the African musical practices in the curriculum and the theory of music aspect of the curriculum. And the curriculum offers Western music and jazz and African music, which um, schools can choose which stream they want to do, which one of those genres they want to follow. But there's only one theory of music program. And of course, it's a one size fits all and it's dominated by Western art music. And Western art music talks about musical structure and there's lots and lots of terminology and it's very abstract. So it's all meanings with weaker semantic gravity. And this works in the CAPS or the South African curriculum is, is, which is called the CAPS. There's an integration between the theory of music and the musical examples. There is that sort of integration um, between the theory in the, in the, in the CAPS and, and the, um, the Western music examples. Um, and so there's this potential for semantic shifting and semantic waving that can take place within the Western art music stream. But the African music theory um, and the African music um, examples, that connection just doesn't happen. Um, so the Western theory of music um, curriculum is just a little bit enhanced by, by African music theory principles. And there are some examples you can see there, ambiguous statements. We don't know if they're about structure or they're about um, axiological stuff. And so they're much more difficult to connect with examples, um, with concrete examples of music. Um, as a result, um, the semantic shifts um, are really, really, really difficult to make in the African music curriculum. There's no uh, way, there's no need, in fact, in the curriculum to make those kind of, ex to use theoretical ideas to explain the music itself. There's no application of those weaker, those meanings with weaker semantic gravity to explain musical examples. And the memoranda suggests that, um, in fact, rote learning is enough for African music and for explaining African music ideas. Um, the, so the finding really, the interesting finding, one of them was that there's this inequality between the two, the, the two curricular streams. The Western art music students, for them, success depends on making connections between meanings with weaker semantic, semantic gravity and stronger semantic gravity. But the African music students, for them, success just depends on rote learning, and those and the rote learning usually formulaic and quite closed statements that don't really depend on um, understanding and unpacking conceptual information. So we end up with, um, uh, in my my um, 
illustration here, if, if C is the high semantic flatline of music theory in the curriculum, which is quite abstract, the meanings of, you know, the weaker semantic gravity of those meanings, very abstract, very conceptual. The, the, the A line, which is a full wave, would be the Western music and the way that's connecting the theory with the practice. Those connections are made. But the dashed line is um, the African music curriculum, which never really connects to those theoretical meanings. And it doesn't really have a, a wide semantic range for the students to develop and to learn. Um, and what did I feel about being called Dr. Carver? Well, for me, it was, um, it was really coming into the community that was, was the most significant. Um, you know, you'll have a friend who knows you just got your PhD and they know it's a big deal and they say, oh, well done, that's amazing. Um, but for peers and for people in the community and for the scholarly community that I've come into, um, the appreciation of being part of, part of that group as a peer has, has been um, the most significant for me. And in particular, I've, I've benefited so much from the friendship and the support of, um, of peers and, and particularly the LCT community. Um, I, I found some buddies early on in, in my research, which was a, a massive support. And in turn, I feel that, you know, it's a way of, of, of playing it forward. I have found friends that who are, um, who are doing their PhDs, who I've just said, come, let's just talk. Um, you're doing maths, I'm doing music, but come and talk to me, tell me what you're doing. So just providing an ear for people who are studying, who need to just talk, who need to bounce ideas off somebody. Um, and that's for me, just part of the ethos of the LCT community and um, the joy of being part of it. And that's it. So thanks for listening and thanks for watching. Well, there you have it. Some really inspiring and insightful stories and some very interesting ways of using LCT across a range of different disciplines. I think what all those stories had in common though was this idea that they were part of the LCT community and so for those of you who are still busy with your own postgraduate studies, I really urge you to tap into the international LCT community, join your own local LCT communities. And if you don't have one in your own university or your own geographic region, why not start one?